across the bridge at Blackfriars, over the River Thames, into the heart of the great metropolis, London. By the 1820s, more than a million people lived and worked in the area which had grown up around the old city. For this was the world's largest port, its greatest trading centre. The city itself, sheltering under the dome of St Paul's, was a maze of narrow streets and alleyways. There were only a few main thoroughfares leading towards the centre, and these were barely adequate for the traffic of the time. Movement was slow and difficult. And in the narrow side streets, sometimes impossible. But there were improvements. The great new thoroughfare of Regent Street had just been opened. And in 1829, a new kind of public conveyance was to appear. London's first omnibus. The superiority of this conveyance over the ordinary stagecoaches must be obvious. All passengers travel in safety and comfort inside the vehicle. The fare charged from Paddington to the bank being only one shilling. The proprietor begs to add that every possible attention will be paid to the accommodation of ladies and children, and that they will be attended by a person of great respectability as conductor. What a very civilised way to travel. What a day to remember. A visit to the park by omnibus. Carry on, driver. Chilibier's omnibus was as practical as it was elegant. It carried 20 people in comfort and was easy to get in and out of. It made travelling a pleasure. And it was so convenient. Within a year, Chilibier had six of these omnibuses, each drawn by three horses, running at half-hourly intervals between Paddington and the bank. Nor was he alone in the field. There was soon to be competition in a similar mode, and in 1833, a new kind of challenge. One Walter Hancock dispensed with horses altogether and relied on steam power to convey passengers between Paddington and the bank. <laughs> but the public, it seemed, preferred horses, at least on the streets of London, and Hancock's enterprise was short-lived. For the next 60 years, London's omnibuses were to be exclusively horse-drawn. The two-horse bus was now the general rule. Smaller than Chilibier's original, they normally carried 12 or 14 passengers, sometimes more, the more intrepid climbing onto the roof. Some proprietors even provided seats behind the driver for them to sit on. Was this a portent of things to come? In 1847, a new, improved omnibus was announced. Its prominent difference from the omnibuses in general use is the raised roof to admit the free entrance of a tall person without stooping and to provide proper seating for persons outside. Thirteen passengers may be carried within and about fourteen on top. The greater seating capacity of these improved omnibuses made reduced fares possible and attracted a wider public. The omnibus was now the most popular way of travelling about London but this very popularity sometimes created problems. In 1851, thousands of people poured into London for the Great Exhibition. The demand for public transport was overwhelming. 
everyone was determined to visit the show of the century and to get there by omnibus. But there were too many people chasing too few buses. Inevitably, something had to give. A quarter of a century had passed since George Shillibeer first introduced the omnibus to London. Countless others had followed him. Now a new name was poised to take over the reins. The London General Omnibus Company, known simply as the General. The General started by buying up most of London's old existing buses. But something new and better was needed. This was to be it. Or something very like it. Wider, and with more headroom than was normal at the time, it could carry 12 passengers inside in greater comfort and up to 14 outside, 10 of them back to back on the so-called knife board seat, the others alongside the driver. The knife board bus, weighing about 2,100 weights and drawn by two horses, was to become the standard London omnibus for more than two decades. As the upper deck could only be reached by ascending a series of metal plates attached to the back end of the bus, it was hardly surprising that this should have been an all-male preserve. Until someone, with a due sense of propriety, made it possible for ladies to ascend to the upper level with dignity. Another welcome innovation was the provision of side-by-side -side seating on a kind of wooden garden seat, in place of the old back-to-back -back knife board. What could be more pleasant on a sunny day than to ride down the street on a garden seat? Wherever your fancy takes you, from Tooting Beck to Charing Cross, to Kensington or the Waxwork Show, Victoria or the Royal Parks. All you would need to ride on a bus was a penny or two for the ticket. And if perchance it should start to rain, well, there was an answer to even that. By the turn of the century, there were more than three and a half thousand licensed horse buses in London with at least 10 times that number of horses to work them. This truly was their heyday. But there were sinister rumblings on and off the stage. A hiss of steam in Hammersmith. An alien lurking in the wings. Different, yet not unfamiliar. It appeared in various guises, but it was undeniably an omnibus. An omnibus without horses. Hancock's dream come true at last. And so, the ghost of Shillibio was finally laid to rest. Or was it? Even as the last trumpet sounded, the ring of iron shoes on cobbles faded, so Shillibio was reborn with a defiant and an almost feline purr. It was christened simply the B-type, and clad in the General's own scarlet livery. No sooner had it made its mark on London streets than the trumpets were to sound again. Only this time, it was a summons. So the B-types went to war, saying goodbye to Piccadilly, farewell to Leicester Square, some 1,300 of London's buses went overseas. And with them, more than 10,000 of London's busmen. Their destinations no longer Paddington or the Bank, but Ypres and the Somme. At home, it was business as usual. Whilst the regulars were engaged on other duties, there was no shortage of volunteers to mind the buses. War or no war, the B-type would still have had a special place in history. For it was the connecting link between the 19th century horse bus and the modern motor bus. It served London well for ten eventful years. And then made way for the K-type. Driver alongside the engine, not behind it. More space for passengers, closer to the ground. This to take Londoners into the twenties. In one form or another, 
The open-top double-decker had reigned supreme on London streets for longer than Queen Victoria. They were to be seen almost everywhere. Moving along in stately procession, pausing for people to hop on and off. Solid, reassuring, they catered for all tastes. By 1923, the general had appointed a new flag bearer. It wore the initials NS and was declared to be nulli secundus, second to none. This was a turning point. Behold the bus for all seasons, the first to have a roof on top. It reached upwards to new heights, a giant in its day, able to carry 54 people in all weathers. Not so much fun, perhaps, as some of its ancestors. But quicker, safer, far more comfortable. 100 years on from Shillibeer, it dominated the London streets and set the fashion for a new generation of omnibuses. The stage was now set for the next act. First to appear was the Regent, initials ST, with enclosed cab up front and an inside staircase to the upper deck at the rear. It was one of the last of the red buses to carry the General's insignia. From the 1st of July, 1933, they were to assume a new identity. A new name carrying on a long tradition along all the old routes. It wore the same colours, but acquired a new look and a style all of its own. It carried us right through the 40s and 50s and on to the present day. The RT. And bearing the same banner, the undisputed route master, the RM. Which leads us into the future. A new generation is with us now. Still unmistakably an omnibus, but with the entrance up front, and the horses behind. We've travelled a long way by omnibus in the past 150 years. Had we stayed with Shillibeer when he first set out from Paddington to the bank, we could have circled the earth more than a hundred times. Today, all of London's buses travel this same distance in just one week. But it is not so much how far we might travel as how nor where, but why. And in this 150th anniversary year of the London Omnibus, we might ask ourselves just what has changed? Apart from the fashion. <laughs> Right, Bert. 